Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be covering Chapter 3 of the Investment Banking Valuation Leverage Buyouts and M&A Second Edition Textbook by Joshua Rosenbaum and Joshua Pearl. It's a phenomenal book, uh, very helpful for anyone who's interested in heading into the investment banking industry or who wants to touch up on their technical skills. In Chapter 3, we're going to be talking about the discounted cash flow model. And just starting off right now, I know it's going to be a very long video. Uh, the presentation is incredibly long. There's a lot of things to talk about. But for anyone who's interested, who, who you know has practiced in class the DCF model but hasn't really understood the thinking behind the assumptions, this video is going to be incredibly helpful. I'm being biased, of course, but I'm fairly confident that this is probably one of the best videos out there on YouTube talking about the discounted cash flow model because it will spend time on each individual assumption. How do you pro project uh, accounts receivable? How do you project inventory? Um, how do you project the, the, the de depreciation and amortization? What is the thinking behind that? We're not just going to be talking about, oh, you know, you project your free cash flows, discount it back to the, the present and then sum it up and then, you know, take enterprise value, go back to implied equity value divided by fully outstanding shares and then get your, you know, uh, equity purchase price. No, we're not going to be doing only that. We're going to be spending a lot of time on the assumptions and the thinking behind the model. So right away, I wanted to take some time and tell you, watch this video in parts. It's a long video, but it's incredibly helpful. So as well, please do like and subscribe to the channel. Uh, I appreciate any support. And if you have any questions, please do comment below. So let's get started. So the discounted cash flow model is a fundamental valuation methodology broadly used by investment bankers, corporate officers, and other finance professionals. It is based on the principle that the value of a company can be derived from the present value of its projected free cash flow. The valuation implied for a target by a DCF is also known as its intrinsic value as opposed to its market value, which is the value ascribed by the market at a given point in time, used as an alternative to market-based analysis. So a lot of investment bankers, they have different valuation methodologies. You have the comparable companies analysis, you have the precedent transactions analysis, and the discounted cash flow model. The, D the DCF is much more intrinsic value. It's valuing the cash flows of the business, whereas the comparable companies analysis and the precedent transactions analysis spends a lot more time on the market value, how the market values that company, not the intrinsic value of the company. So in a DCF, a company's free cash flow is typically projected for a period of five years. We'll talk about why and we'll talk about when that changes. The projection period, however, may be longer depending on the company's sector, stage of de development, and the underlying predictability of its financial performance. Given the inherent difficulties in accurately projecting a company's financial performance over an extended period of time, a terminal value is used to capture the remaining value of the target beyond the projection period. As well, we're going to be spending and debating the importance of the terminal value and why like you really need to make sure that your terminal value is correct because two-thirds of the overall valuation of the dcf model originates from the terminal value not the explicit forecast period the projected free cash flow and terminal value are discounted to the present at the target's weighted average cost of capital which is a discount rate with its business and financial risks. The present value of the free cash flow and terminal value are summed to determine an enterprise value, which serves as the basis for the free DCF evaluation. So the discounted cash flow model projects the company's enterprise value. Now enterprise value values the core operations of a business attributable to both debt and equity holders. So what that means is that the unlevered free cash flow that you're projecting is Again, it's unlevered, which means that it's attributable to both debt and equity holders. So when we're valuing that unlevered free cash flow, that the value that we get is essentially the enterprise value, which is attributable to both debt and equity holders. If we were to project using le levered free cash flow, we would be getting the equity value of the business because levered free cash flow is only attributable to equity holders. Therefore, the projected value of the net overall D DCF model would be equity value because it's attributable only to equity holders. So as a result, a DCF output is viewed in terms of a valuation range based on a range of key input assumptions rather than as a single value. The impact of these assumptions on valuation is tested using the sensitivity analysis. So that's essentially a quick summary. So the steps to the DCF uh, model, study the target and determine key performance drivers. Step two, project the free cash flow. Step three, calculate the weighted average cost of capital. Four, determine the terminal value and then calculate the present value and determine valuation by discounting the future free cash flows and the terminal value back to the present. 
There's a lot of assumptions in these steps, and we're going to go through each one. So step one, study the target and determine key performance drivers. The first step in performing a DCF, as with any valuation exercise, is to study and learn as much as possible about the target and its sector. A thorough understanding of the target's business model, financial profile, value proposition for customers, and markets, uh, com competitors, and key risk is essential for developing a framework for valuation. The banker needs to be able to craft or support a realistic set of financial proje projections as well as the weighted average cost of capital and terminal value assumptions for the target. So understanding your business is incredibly important. At the undergraduate level, when you're doing cases, it's not so much, but in the real world, a lot of these assumptions, you need to be very familiar with the business, how it reports earnings, how it depreciates different costs. It's very, very important. The next level of analysis involves determining the key drivers of a company's performance with the goal of crafting a defensible set of free cash flow projections. These drivers can both be both internal, such as opening new facilities, stores, developing new products, securing new customer contracts, and improving operational or uh, working capital efficiency, as well as external, such as acquisitions and market trends, consumer buying patterns, macroeconomic factors, or even legislative regulatory changes. So essentially, when you're projecting your free cash flow, you're, you're starting at the top line, you're starting at revenue, you're not starting at EBIT. Again, for cases, the quick way to do it, you start at EBIT. But for real models, you're starting at the top line of the business. And so you need to understand how revenues are going to expand. And revenues are not just internal growth. Maybe a company will consider an acquisition in the future. So you need to account for that in one of your cases. You know, maybe it's your bullish case where the company pursues an acquisition which expands its revenues by X amount of percentage. So in step two, we're now projecting that free cash flow. So we've understood the business. We understand the assumptions. We know how the business is going to grow. Now we can actually project it. So after studying the target and determining key performance drivers, the banker is prepared to project its free cash flow. Free cash flow is the cash generated by a company after paying all cash operating assets, expenses, and associated taxes, as well as the funding of CAPEX and working capital, but prior to the payment of any interest expense because it's unlevered. If it was levered, we'd account for the interest expense. Free cash flow is independent of capital structure as it represents the cash available to all capital providers. Now, for people who don't understand that, essentially, we're looking at the cash that a business generates, but not anything before any interest is paid. The moment interest is paid, we've already accounted for the cash that is paid out to debt holders, right? Because they only receive interest and any principal repayment. So, and then what's left is the equity holders. So with the levered free cash flow, that's attributable only to equity holders. With unlevered free cash flow, which is this, this is the calculation. You start at uh, earnings before interest and tax. So EBIT, take away taxes to get no pat, net operating profit after tax. You then uh, add back depreciation amortization. You take away capital expenditures. You take away any increase or decrease in networking capital to get your unlevered free cash flow. And we'll go into each of these assumptions why is that the case but just for now this is the unlevered free cash flow meaning we haven't accounted for any interest expenses and therefore the debt holders are not, have not been paid and so this cash is attributable to both debt and equity holders that's why it represents the cash available to all providers of capital now let's look at the considerations for projecting free cash flow first the historical performance. Historical performance provides valuable insight for developing defensible assumptions to project free cash flow. Past growth rates, profit margins, and other ratios are usually a reliable indicator of future performance, especially for mature companies in non-cyclical sectors. While it is informative to review historical data from a long, uh, fr from as long as a time horizon as possible, typically the prior three-year period, if available, serves as a good proxy for projecting future financial performance. Uh, for growing companies, you know, mid-size, even kind of larger companies, a three-year historical performance is relatively fair. If you were to look at a very large blue chip company, you can kind of go back to about five years. Really, you have to keep in mind how has the business changed in the past three years? If they have really revolutionized their strategic strategy, their strategy and their thinking and their business and the, the, the divisions that they operate in, the, the shorter the, the time horizon, the historical performance, the better. 
because with a, with that change, the assumptions change as well. So you can't look back five years and, and, and calculate an average because it would be unfair to assume that because the, the business was in one state five years ago, it won't be in that same state. So projecting it based on a previous state is unfair. So you really have to question how many years back you're looking. For a business that has been stable and hasn't changed its strategy for a while, you can go back longer. For a business that is changing rapidly, that is growing, or that you know th they've changed their strategic their strategic focus, so they can they can maximize shareholder value, going back a few a sh shorter years is better. Okay. The next is the projection period length. Very very important. Typically, the banker projects the target's free cash flow for a period of five years, depending on its sector, stage of development, and the predictability of its financial performance. It is critical to project free cash flow to a point in the future where the target's financial performance reaches a steady state or normalized level. Now, what does steady state mean? This is very important because when you're projecting your free cash flows in the explicit periods, you want to project the final period value of free cash flow or EBITDA because those values need to be accurate in order for your terminal value to be accurate. Whether the terminal the terminal value calculation will be the exit multiple or the Gordon growth method, the, that free cash flow or EBITDA metric needs to be reflective of a normal steady state of the business. If you are projecting really, really high uh, growth, that would be quite unfair because maybe yes it is in a, in a cyclical high but the the terminal value is capturing the perpetuity of that business the per performance of that business forever right so if you were assuming that the business forever will perform at that very very cyclical high level that's unfair inaccurate and will really really uh the value of your projection will be very low at the same time, if you project a very low metric, then that's unfair. You're undervaluing the business because you're assuming that, oh, that that measure is going to be there. That's going to be the benchmark forever. No, that's just a cyclical low. So you really want to hit a steady state where it's in between a cyclical, cyclical high and a cyclical low, right? So for very cyclical businesses, this is a, a important assumption. So you need to determine how many years out do I need to project out the business's performance to reach that steady state. Say, for example, we're in a cyclical high right now. You need to account for the downwards performance eventually to where you reach a normalized level. If we're in a cyclical low, you need to account for that initial increase up until a point where there is that normalized level, right? So for businesses that are growing very, very fast, they won't reach their, their steady state for a long time. So fast growing businesses, I think it's uh, in this, I'll, I'll go back to that slide afterwards. So for fast growing businesses, you want to project further out because it's going to take a longer time for them to reach their steady state. For slow growing businesses who have are, who are really in their steady state right now and don't really see a lot of volatility in their earnings, pre having a shorter forecast period makes sense because it does like it's not worth it projecting 10 years out for a, a, a blue chip company. You can capture that same value in the terminal value because whatever metric you're using, whether free cash flow or EBITDA, it will capture that in the terminal value calculation. For a solid company that is in a cyclical business, that five-year projection horizon makes sense because it, that's, that should kind of match the length of a business cycle or at least half of a business cycle where either it reduces it, the, the performance adjusts to a normalized, normalized level or it increases to that normalized level. Right. So in situations where a company is in the early stage of rapid growth, projecting longer term, 10 plus years would be more appropriate. In addition, a longer projection period is often used for businesses in sectors with long term contracted revenue streams, such as natural resources, satellite communications or utilities. I made a separate video, the uh, common mistakes in DCF models. I'll, I'll link that in the video description where I talked about this. Uh, for a mining company that I covered, Dominion Diamond, uh, I published some research on it. And my DCF model, initially, I projected, I believe, like seven years. But the company in its investors presentation shows you what the projected free cash flows of their mines are because they're well aware of how they're going to mine their mines. They have X amount of existing resources that, you know, they've conducted this research and know that this is the amount of ounces of, of ore they have and they know how the production schedule is going to look. So for 
these contracted revenues or expected you know production schedules you can confidently determine that yes it, this mine is going to produce till 2034 so i can actually project uh, explicitly the the year by year of a free cash flow of that business up until 2034 which really increases the accuracy of your business you want to make sure that really the the overall value increases in accuracy if your explicit period or forecast period is extended. So the longer you project, the more accurate your value is. Because with terminal, the terminal value assumption, it's really a proxy. It's just a shortcut to get the, the to fill up that valuation gap, which results in a lot of errors. Unfortunately, in some cases, you can't for the blue chip company because they don't have contracted revenues. They 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 depend on cyclical highs and cyclical lows, or you know just sales performance. So in that case, using the terminal value is the better option. Again, there's a lot of a lot of considerations with just the projection period, but that's a relatively good summary. Now, projecting the financial performance without guidance. In some instances, a DCF is performed without the benefit of receiving an initial set of projections. For publicly traded companies, consensus research estimates for financial statistics such as sales, EBITDA, and EBIT, which are generally provided for a future two or three year period, are typically used to form the basis for developing a set of projections. Individually, equity research reports may provide additional financial detail, including in some instances, a full scale two year or more projection model. Essentially what this slide is getting at is that the some work has already been done for you. There are a lot of equity research analysts out there from the major banks that cover a lot of these companies. So you as a banker can refer to that those research estimates and that's what I do with my model. So whenever I conduct research, I go straight I go straight to the equity research reports after I've learned about the company and I look at the projections. And of course I test them myself. I ask my I ask key questions, is that really fair? And majority of the time it is because well they spend their entire livelihood on that and I take those three, four year uh, or two to three year projections and I input that in my model right away. So I don't even have to risk really deviating away from the consensus because if all these analysts are projecting that you know, the company is going to perform at X level, then I can be confident that based on all of their efforts, that level will be reached, right? And so I go and I, and I input that, the, that, uh, that information into my model and it really speeds up the process. Okay, so for public companies, the banker often sources top line projections for the first two to three years uh, of the projection period from consensus, consensus estimates. Similarly, for private companies, consensus estimates for peer companies can be used as a proxy for expected sales growth rates, provided the trend line is consistent with historical performance and sector outlook. Beyond three years, without the benefit of management guidance, it depends more on longer term trends defined in sector reports and management commentary. So this is where that due diligence for the company comes in hand. After three years, equity research reports are not going to really tell you about that un unless they initiate initial coverage. But after that, they're just going to update kind of the three year timeline. So really, then what you have to do is you have to look at your assumptions and what you learned about the company and say, can they support X percentage of growth? Are they going to reach a higher level of growth based on acquisitions, external or organic growth? Or are they going to reach a lower level of growth as they settle into a steady state? So again, that's where the due diligence comes in. But for the first three years, a lot of a lot of students like they worry oh you know like well how am i going to project the sales right away no you don't you don't have to spend a lot of time on that equity research analysts have already done that for you go to the reports see what they projected see the consensus consensus estimates and then take that and input, input that in your model right away in the absence of a reliable guidance, the banker typically steps down the growth rates incrementally in the outer years of the projection period to arrive at a reasonable long-term growth rate by the terminal year, right? So reaching that steady state. For a highly cyclical business, such as steel or lumber, lumber companies, sales levels need to track the movements of the underlying commodity cycle. Regardless of where in the cycle the projection period begins, it is crucial that the terminal year of financial performance represents a normalized level as opposed to a cyclical, cyclical high or low. Now, in my experience, I did a DCF model for a nickel company. And when I did that, I took the underlying commodity price at the end of each of the years, and I kind of matched that to the annual sales numbers. And I tried to see if there was a relationship. To, to the sales numbers there was you know some of there was a relationship not as, as strong as i expected but one that i could really take as a marker so when i projected out the the company's uh, performance out outside of that three-year uh projection period i took my assumptions of where the commodity price would be and use that as the marker to really kind of help me project the the sales of the business so that's something that you can do especially for cyclical companies 
Now, therefore, in a DCF for a cyclical company, top line projections might peak in the early years of the projection period and then decline before returning to a normalized level by the terminal year, right? So that's what in the first three, four years, you have that business adjusting to a normalized level or eventually declining and hitting that, 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 that terminal year. So again, it depends again on where the business is in the business cycle. Furthermore, the banker must ensure that sales projections are consistent with other related assumptions in the DCF, such as those for CAPEX and working capital. For example, higher top line growth typically requires the support of higher levels of CAPEX and working capital. And we'll talk about those projections uh, in, in, in future slides. Really, you just usually majority of the time people just take the percentage of sales. So as sales increase, the, per, uh, the percentage, the amount of CAPEX and working capital also increases. So what about COGS and SGNA projections? For public companies, the banker typically relies upon historical COGS and SGNA levels and or sources estimates from research to derive the initial years of the projection period, if available. For the outer years of the projection period, it is common to hold gross margin and SGNA as a percentage of sales constant, although the banker may assume a slight improvement or decline if justified by company trends or outlook for the market. So SGNA and COGS are relatively simple to project. Usually, a lo it's very common to see just percentage of sales. Uh, for equity research reports, you can kind of depend on those assumptions, or you can you can just take the research estimates uh, from a top line perspective, and then just take the historical the past three year average for SGNA and COGS. Take those percentages, uh, you know, multiply that by the cost uh, the sales, and and get your uh, SGNA and COGS. Right, and then for the outer years, you can kind of continue that using a percentage of sales. Now, in the first three years, you can kind of assume that that those percentages are constant. But for me, I, I favor a, a slight improvement in in the in the outer years because usually a lot of the time when companies hit that steady state when they become larger for growth they always seek cost reduction that's you always see these big companies announce oh we're going to cut costs by three billion that's our plan our target for the next three years so you kind of eventually as the companies grow and hit a larger size of for the organization their goals are to start reducing and cutting the slack in the organization so i usually project uh, sgna percentages uh, more favorably in the outer years which means uh, a lower percentage so what about EBITDA and EBIT projections? For public companies, EBITDA and EBIT projections for the future two or three year period are typically sourced from consensus, uh, consensus estimates, sorry, uh, if available. These projections inherently capture both gross profit performance and SGNA expenses. So once again, we talked about how you can use equity research uh, projections for sales. You can also use uh, the, the projections of EBITDA and EBIT uh, for your model for the first two to three years because usually the, the research reports will project sales EBITDA and EBIT right and of course then you can just kind of find the difference between EBITDA and EBIT to get your depreciation and amortization projection as well but we'll talk about that later so here, take, an, take an example this was a company that I recently did some research on liquor stores NA uh, and I took the kind of consensus estimates from uh, fortraders.com uh, and I inputted it into this kind of quick little excel uh for my hair. So essentially you have the annual performance for 2014, 15 and 16, which we know they're the real actual numbers. And these are the sales numbers, etc. Right. And then I took the numbers that are were provided on online by the research analysts. And so I now know that in 2017, 18 and 19, the expected sales performance based on all of these analysts that spend all their time communicating with management, spending time following the company uh, on the quarterly earnings call, talking to them. So they're relatively familiar with the company and they feel that on average, this is the performance of the company. And so that's great. They've saved me some work. Now what I can do is I can then, oh, now what I can do is I can then calculate the average cost uh, uh, percentage of sales for COGS and the gross margin, right? So then I calculate the average. So uh, COGS makes up about 74.58% uh, of sales on average based on the three year historical performance of COGS. So then I can really just take that average and multiply that, that by the uh, sales projection number and I get my COGS projection for the next three years based on that, which is relatively defensible. Same thing I can do for gross margin, which is essentially the difference, really, which is, you know, uh, one minus uh, the uh, COGS margin, right, which gives me the gross margin. Uh, 
And then I can do the same thing for SGNA, where I, I project the uh, based on uh, the percentage of sales, uh, the average uh, SGNA for the 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 estimate will be 20.32%, uh, right? So I can multiply 20.32% by the projection uh, projected sales to get uh, SGNA projection for the next three years, right? And I fill those in, and then I find the difference between uh, EBITDA and B EBIT, and boom. So my first three years of my DCF model. I can spend about 10 minutes on just this is a quick shortcut of course you can you have to go through and again kind of defend these assumptions but this is a great marker to really start off your model with you just depend on people who've already done the work for you work smart not hard that's what that's a very common saying and this is a great way and a great il illustration of this in, in banking okay so a common approach for projecting EBITDA and EBIT for the outer years is to hold their margins constant at the level represented by the last year provided by consensus estimates. So essentially what that means is that you take the percentage, so you divide 50 by 884 and 36 by 884, and that margin can kind of hold constant or uh, increase, in, increase it by a little bit or decrease it by a little bit. That's, again, it depends on uh, the type of company. For stable companies, that works. But for growing companies, you need to start projecting EBITDA as well. Okay. So uh, as previously discussed, however, increasing or decreasing levels of profitability may be modeled throughout the projection period, perhaps due to product mix changes, cyclicality, operating leverage, or pricing power or pressure, right? So it depends on the company. Now in a DCF analysis, EBIT typically serves as the springboard for calculating free cash flow. To bridge from EBIT to free cash flow, several additional items need to be determined, including the marginal tax rate, depreciation and amortization, capex, and changes in net working capital. So we've talked about the projections all the way to EBIT now. Now we can finally go down to free cash flow to get an accurate free cash flow projection. So tax projections. Using the company's most recent or average effective tax rate remains a suitable strategy to project any tax when calculating free cash flow. Working off the unlevered free cash flow formula, tax is subtracted from EBIT to get er earnings before interest and after tax. It is important to understand that a company's effective tax rate, or the rate that it actually pays in taxes, often differs from the marginal tax rate due to the use of tax credits, non-deductible expenses, deferred uh, tax asset valuation allowances, and other uh, company-specific tax policies. So this it works. I mean, it depends on the company, especially if the company was uh, was losing money before and is turning more profitable now. Using the company's effective tax rate is unfair because it would be very low relative to what it should be in the future. But if it's a very stable company, uh, it doesn't have a lot of these write-offs or, or, or non-deductible expenses that it can use, then using the company's effective tax rate is is appropriate. So again, you, it depends on the company that you're looking at. But I would just say the effective tax rate works for large companies and growing companies, but for uh, companies that have suffered uh, profitability-wise in the past, I'd say five to five to ten years, the company's effective tax rate needs to be judged and it needs to be con uh, con changed if you are considering uh, profitability in the future. If you're projecting losses, uh, especially in a distress scenario, then that's a different conversation, which I'm not going to have now because that's very long. Uh, what about uh, depreciation amortization projections? So depreciation is a non-cash expense that approximates the reduction of the book value of a company's long-term fixed assets or property, plant, and equipment over an estimated useful life and reduces reported earnings. Amortization, like depreciation, is a non-cash expense that reduces the value of a company's definite life intangible assets and also reduces reported earnings. So really, depreciation is uh, a non-cash charge for tangible assets, whereas amortization is intangible assets. Um, my comment, some people don't get it still, but essentially the reason why we add back depreciation is because it's a non-cash expense. We're writing down the value of assets because we have to adjust for the use of that asset. But there's no real cash going out. When we're projecting free cash flow, we're talking about real hard cash. What is the real hard cash that the business generates? What is the unlevered free cash flow of the business? Well, depreciation reduces net income because it's accounting for that expense, that charge. But in real terms, there is no cash outflow. Therefore, we add back that depreciation and amortization expense to account for the real free cash flow generated by the business. 
Now, depreciation expenses are typically scheduled over several years corresponding to the useful life of each of the company's respective asset classes. The straight line depreciation method assumes a uniform depreciation expense over the estimated life of an asset. Most other depreciation methods fall under the category of accelerated depreciation, which assumes that an asset loses most of its value in the early years of its life. Now, this is very important. I'm currently reading a book, and I'm going to make a video about it in the future, The Big Deal by Bruce Wasserstein. He's a legendary uh, investment banker who ended his career at Lazard. And essentially, one of the things that he, he commented on as an analyst and investment banker, you need to pay attention to the, the companies and their depreciation methods. Uh, he provided an example in the book about two airline companies, two big American airline companies. And when he was comparing the two airline companies, one of them, they were depreciating it on a straight line basis, both of them, the same exact similar planes, really, uh, 747s, but one had a useful life of 15 years, while the other defined a useful life of 20 years. Now, so we're depreciating using both the straight line method, and we're assuming the same terminal value, but if we're de the, the, the timeline for depreciation is shorter for one company relative to the other, the one with a shorter timeline will under-report earnings because they will have to account for a higher depreciation charge for the 15 years, whereas the other company spreads it out across 20 years. So the annual depreciation charge is significantly less. Therefore, they're inflating their earnings. So when he was comparing the two companies, it's unfair to really just look at the, the multiples of, of, uh, of EBIT. Because when you you look at those EBIT multiples, well, one is is depreciate has a higher depreciation charge, whereas the other has a lower, right? And it would be unfair to compare it on a multiples basis, right? So you had to make that adjustment. So these are some of the little things that you need to pay attention to. So when you're looking at depreciation, not only do you have to understand what's the difference between straight line and accelerated, but you have to look at those assumptions. So what is what is the useful life? Um, and, and what is the terminal value? What if companies, one company assumes that the plane has a terminal value of $10 million, while the other has a, uh, has a terminal value of $20 million? Then the amount of, of uh, uh, the amount of depreciation written, written down and reported across the years is much smaller for the higher terminal value because they have to write down less, right? So these are all assumptions. It's very important, right? So when, when people talk about it being a science, it really is a science because there are so many things to consider, okay? Now, for DCF modeling purposes, depreciation is often projected as a percentage of sales or CAPEX based on historical levels as it is directly re related to a company's capital spending, which in turn tends to support top-line growth. For a DCF constructed on the basis of EBITDA and EBIT projections, depreciation can simply be calculated as the, as the difference between the two. In this scenario, however, the banker must ensure that the implied depreciation and amortization is consistent with historical levels as well as CAPEX, CAPEX projections. So going back to that liquor stores example, which we had in the previous uh, a few slides ago, when we took those EBITDA and EBIT projections and you saw the depreciation amortization that was reported, uh, it was $14, 16 and then 14 right? It, of course, in millions of dollars. So it's $14 million, $16 million, $14 million. Well, that decline in the third year of the projection period is just because of the averages that we took from the consent, consensus estimates. So even though analysts project that, we need to stand by our assumptions. So we take the percentage of sales from the historical perspective and compare that to what the projections say. So sometimes even the projections that are provided by analysts don't make sense. So you really need to understand the de depreciation side because this is important, especially when you're calculating free cash flow, because this is something that increases your free cash flow. So if you're adding back a lower value than it should be, then you're un under really reporting and under calculating free cash flow, which impacts the overall value of the business. So very, very important. Okay. What about projecting CAPEX? Capital expenditures are the funds that a company uses to purchase, improve, expand, or replace physical assets such as buildings, equipment, facilities, machinery, and other assets. CAPEX is an expenditure as, a, as opposed to an expense. What's the difference between the two? Expense is reoccurring, whereas an expenditure, it, the management has discretion. They can either increase that this expenditure or decrease it, whereas ex an expense is reoccurring. It is capitalized on the balance sheet once the expenditure is made and then expensed over its useful life as depreciation through the company's income statement. Okay. 
Historically, levels generally serve as a, a reliable proxy for projecting for future capex. However, capex projections may deviate from historical levels in accordance with the company's strategy, sector, or phase of operations. Research reports may also provide CAPEX estimates for the future two or three year period. In the absence of specific guidance, CAPEX is generally driven as a percentage of sales in line with historical levels due to the fact that top line growth typically needs to be supported by growth in the company's asset base. I agree with this. I think that it's I think that really the way you should be projecting CAPEX is using the percentage of sales. So you just look at the, the the top line growth. You see if revenues are increasing, the company needs to support that increase by spending more on increasing the asset base or supporting and replacing the asset base. So that perfectly makes sense. But when you're pro projecting CAPEX, you use percentage of sales. Now, what about projecting networking capital? This is probably the least known way, okay? Because a lot of people, depreciation amortization, they take percentage of sales. CAPEX, they, t they take percentage of sales. And then the quick and dirty way is to do percentage of sales for networking capital as well. But there are a lot of assumptions that are overlooked when you do that. So let's look at the two ways. So networking capital is inherently defined as non-cash current assets, less non-interest bearing current liabilities. So we're not accounting for cash and cash equivalents or current uh, long-term debt. Remember that because a lot of people do that and you're just, no, that's not networking capital. It's non-cash current assets, less non-interest bearing current liabilities. It serves as a measure of how much cash a company needs to fund its operations on an ongoing basis. So common current assets are accounts receivable, inventory, prepaid expenses, common current liabilities are accounts payable, accrued liabilities, and other current liabilities, not current long-term debt or cash and cash equivalents because that is a non-operating asset. Now, okay, let's actually, let me just explain why we don't include that in a networking capital calculation. So theoretically, cash and cash equivalents are considered non-operating assets. They're generated by core operations, but then they don't generate core revenues. They just sit on the balance sheet. Though, so they're really considered non-operating assets. So when you're calculating the enterprise value of a business, what we talked about, the DCF, the final result that you get is the enterprise value of the business. Well, the enterprise value values the company's core operations, not its non-core operations. So including cash in the calculation of its core operations would not be theoretically correct. So that's why you remove it. It's the same thing with debt because debt, debt is already accounted for in the enterprise value calculation. So that's double counting really, and that would be incorrect. So you take away debt because the enterprise value would be calculated. And actually we take away debt afterwards to really get our implied equity value. So you'd be double counting if you were to include the current portion of long-term debt and current liabilities. There you go. So here's the calculation, just you know, the formula. So accounts receivable plus inventory plus prepaid expenses plus other assets. Uh, less accounts payable plus accrued liabilities plus other ass uh, other current uh, liabilities. Now, the change in networking capital from year to year is important for calculating free cash flow as it represents an annual source or use of cash for the company. An increase in networking capital over a given period, i.e. when current assets increase by more than current liabilities, is a use of cash. This is typically uh, this is typical for a growing company, which tends to increase its spending on inventory to support sales growth. I'm going to spend a lot of time on networking capital projections because this is, oh, everyone makes mistakes on this one here. I just, there's not a lot of students out there that understand these projections. So first of all, let's understand why is an increase in networking capital a use of cash? Why do we take, why do we subtract an increase in networking capital from in in our net, uh, in our free cash flow calculation, why is that subtracted? Why why isn't that added back if networking capital increases? Well, networking capital, the, the the current assets of a business, really tie up cash. Say for example, you look at accounts receivable. That's a current asset, and if accounts receivable increases more than um, uh, accounts payable. That means that the business is waiting for this amount of cash to, to, to come into the business and be reported as cash. You know, they're waiting for their payment, 
right? And so what that means is that you're tying up that cash that the company could use in current assets. So when current assets increase, essentially what it's saying, it, when current assets increase more than current liabilities and therefore networking capital increases, what that means is that more cash is being tied up in the business. It's a use of cash because we don't we, the business can't access that cash. It will in the future, but not now. Whereas, say, for example, current assets were to increase less than current liabilities. Well, current liabilities, what it does is it pushes the payment of cash further down the line. So you can you you have more access to cash now than in the future when you're going to have to pay for those current liabilities. So that's a source of cash as as if current liabilities increase more than current assets, then that's a source of cash because we have ac more access to cash now than in the future. That's really, really, really important to understand. Okay, so conversely, an increase in accounts payable or a decrease in networking capital represents a source of cash as it is money that can be retained by the company as opposed to paid out. So there you go. Now, there are two ways to project changes in networking capital. There is the way that we just talked about, which is the percentage of sales. And that's what majority of people of students do in cases or for real the real world models where real analysts are projecting networking capital there's the more granular and recommended approach which is to project the individual components of both current assets and current liabilities for each year in the projection period networking capital and year over year changes are then calculated accordingly right so instead of just taking the percentage of sales or projecting the individual components of current assets and current liabilities then finding the difference between the two to get our networking capital and then finding the year to year change which is then subtracted away from uh, uh, free cash flow. So it's a much longer approach, but it is much more accurate. Okay, so the so the first method, looking at the same company we did before, liquor stores. These are the historical non uh, non cash current assets and non cash interest uh, non interest bearing current liabilities. You find the difference between the two, which is total net working capital right over here. So this is our total non cash current assets. This is our total uh, non interest bearing current liabilities. You find the difference, which is total networking capital. We here, here we have the same sales line as in the previous slide. We calculate the percentage, so we divide this number by this number to get 14.25% in 2013 and then 13.76% in 2014, right? And then you take the average of this, and that means that the average networking capital that, uh, of that business is 13.75%. You then, in the future, take your your sales projections, you multiply this number by your projected sales to get your networking capital. And the, the difference between you know 2017 and 2018, that change is what you, you know, subtract away from, what you take away from your free cash flow calculation. So that's the number, that change is what, and essentially that's what the calculation says is take away any change in networking capital, right? You'd think, okay, that's relatively good, right? You know, it's based on historical numbers and all that kind of stuff. And yes, that's very good, but look at this, last uh, the last uh, year and for 2016 relative to 2015 the percentage of sales went from 14.75 percent to 12.22 percent why is that the case well based on different performance uh performance considerations for the business and based on the macroeconomic environment it impacted the amount of accounts receivable the amount of inventory on hand and all that right so it's better to go at a lower level at a more granular level to understand you know inventory accounts receivable accounts payable and see how that's responding to external factors and internal factors right and so that's the second method now I spent, I think I made a 15 minute video just talking about projecting each of these components, accounts receivable, inventory, prepaid expenses. So I do recommend that you go on my channel and check that video out because I'm only going to rush through this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. This is a huge component of the discounted cash flow model because a lot of the time the assumptions that people make are incorrect. So you can use ratios to project each of the individual individual line items. So. And I'll take an example. Let's use the day's sales outstanding ratio, the DSO ratio for accounts receivable. So to project accounts receivable in the future, you can calculate the DSO ratio historically. So if you look at the accounts receivable line uh, historically for the past two to three years, you can take the accounts receivable that was reported, divide it by sales and multiply it by 365. And that day sales outstanding ratio essentially represents the amount of days that it takes for an accounts receivable be, uh, uh, an accounts receivable to be realized so that it's paid back, right? So that uh, the company receives the cash from that account receivable. 
okay? Now, the higher the ratio, the worse it is, right? Because the longer it would take for that account receivable to be paid. Whereas the lower the ratio, the better it is. Now, usually, all of these ratios are relatively consistent. So the deviation is maybe by, you know, a few percentage points, not a lot. So that means that when you're looking at these, the projections that you're getting are relatively consistent in the future. So what, So in this case, what you can do is you can then take the DSO ratio, that was the, the average for the past three years. You Then you take your sales projections, which you took from the consensus, consensus estimates from the equity research reports, and you have your 365. And so you can kind of rearrange the formula so that on the left hand side accounts receivable is the only um, uh, variable and so really what you're doing is you're dividing a uh, day sales ratio by 365 and you're multiplying that result by the projected sales to get your accounts receivable which is projected for that respective year and so that's what a lot of analysts do they project their model so that they project the individual line items of accounts receivable. They use the uh, DIH ratio for the inventory. Accounts payable does the DPO ratio. And then the prepaid expenses and accrued liabilities, those can be projected using the uh, percentage of sales method. But by going line by line and then summing up the uh, total uh, current assets and total uh, current liabilities and finding the net working capital, the projections are much more accurate and defensible. At the end of the day, as an analyst, when you're pitching business, you want to make sure that you're looking at this company and saying, look, like this, we've looked at the performance of your accounts receivable line. And it makes sense that based on, you know, the, the, the timing of your customers, that projecting accounts receivable at this level makes sense based on the DSO ratio. So it's your, your projections are much more defensible if you go by projecting the individual components of networking capital. Okay, so now a quick overview. These are everything that we talked about really so far in the video. So for projecting sales, EBITDA and EBIT, the first way is to take analyst estimates. And then afterwards, you can look at market reports for the longer term, the outer three years. You can take the due diligence that you have done and understand. The, and now that you understand the business, you can project the outwards uh, the sales. For gross profit and COGS, you're taking percentage of sales. For depreciation and amortization, the first way is to use percentage of sales or CAPEX, or you can take the difference between the projected EBITDA and EBIT that's found in analyst estimates. For CAPEX, you're doing percentage of sales, that's usually your first method, or you can take take a look at the analyst reports and see what how they are pr uh, projecting CAPEX. Especially if the business is currently merging with another business or acquired a business and then you spend a, 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 a unusual amount of CAPEX to really kind of adjust for the new operations, then analyst reports are much more valuable. But in cases where the business is just operating the way it is, using percentage of sales is fair. For SGNA, percentage of sales also works. And for networking capital, we have the percentage of sales, which is not recommended. And what you should be doing for when you're projecting networking capital is to project each component. Holy moly, this slide is super valuable. If you understand each of these methods, you'll, your projections will be phenomenal. It will be incredibly accurate and I, you'll just stand out, especially in interviews. So now let's go to step three of five. Calculate the weighted average cost of capital. So WAC is a broadly accepted standard for use as the discount rate to calculate the present value of a company's projected free cash flow and terminal value. It represents the weighted average of the required return on the invested capital in a given company. Companies with diverse business segments may have different costs of capital for their various businesses. In these instances, it may be advisable to conduct a DCF using a sum of parts approach in which a separate uh, discounted cash flow analysis is performed for each distinct business segment with its own uh, weighted average cost of capital. So WAC is a discount rate, which accounts for the cost of debt and the cost of capital, which are the sources of capital, right? So the weighted average cost of capital. Um, and for companies with diverse business segments, such as GE, it, General Electric, it's better to just look at the individual components, take the 26 divisions, value each of the divisions, then sum them up. And that's a much better way to project the value of diverse businesses. But for relatively common businesses, you just take the weighted average cost of capital and discount the projected free cash flows of the business. So here is the formula for WAC. Essentially, you're taking the cost of debt. So RD is the cost of debt and RC is the cost of equity. And now this is pre-tax. Now you tax affect the cost of debt. You don't tax affect the cost of equity. You tax affect the cost of debt. So times one minus T, the marginal tax rate. So now you have the after-tax cost of debt. And then you find the, the, the weight 
of that cost of debt overall relative to the total market value of capital, right? So D plus E equals the total market value of capital. So the market D is the market value of cap uh, of debt and E is the market value of equity. If we add these two together, we get the total market value of capital. Now if we divide the market value of debt by the total market value of capital, we get the average uh, the uh, weighting of of debt relative to total capital, right? And so we then multiply that by the tax affected cost of debt and then we add that to the cost of equity times its weighting in the overall cost structure of the company to get our weighted average cost of capital. So the weighted average of the cost, uh, the after-tax cost of debt and the cost of equity. So now WAC is predicted on choosing a target capital structure for the company that is consistent with its long-term strategy. So this target capital structure is represented by the debt to total capitalization, so D divided by D plus E, and equity to co total capitalization, so E divided by D plus E ratios. In the absence of explicit company guidance on target capital structure, the banker examines the company's current and historical debt to capitalization ratios, as well as capitalization of its peers. So essentially, what is the target capital structure? So when we're looking at the market value of, uh, of debt and the market value of equity, equity you want to look at these weightings and you want to see, is that fair to say that for the next 10 years, that will be the relative weighting of debt and equity in the business? Is that its target capital structure or is it very uncommon? And the, the business recently acquired a, a new company, and so their their weighting of debt is significantly higher than its historical performance. You want to get the historical debt to total capitalization and equity to total capitalization. You don't want to get its current. Now, this is something for more advanced levels. For you know cases, you don't really need to pay attention to this. But when you're actually valuing real companies, this is important to pay attention to because if if you are looking at the present. Uh, status of the business and there's some you know uh, just uh, really like unnatural weighting right now debt to cap uh, total capitalization because of a recent acquisition it would be unfair to take that and then project weighted average cost of capital because then in the future if that company pays down debt then that whack is not relevant anymore and it's incorrect when discounting a free cash flows so it's important that you use the target capital structure Okay. In the finance community, the approach used to determine a company's target capital structure may differ from firm to firm. For public companies, existing capital structure is generally used as a target capital structure as long as it is comfortably within the range of the com uh, comparable companies. For private companies, the mean or medium for the comparables is typically used. Once the target capital structure is chosen, it is assumed to be held constant throughout the projection period. Now, Let's just talk a little bit about this theory, the optimal ca capital structure, because it's important to understand, okay, why is the, uh, the target capital structure so important? So when there is no debt in the capital structure, the weighted average cost of capital is equal to the cost of equity, right? Because we're not taking any weighting from the cost of debt. As the proportion of debt in the capital structure increases, WAC gradually decreases due to the tax deductibility of the interest expense related to debt. So WAC continues to decrease up to the point where the optimal capital structure is reached. Once this threshold is surpassed, the cost of potential fin financial distress begins to override the tax advantages of debt. So taking my mouse over here, let's look at WAC. So focus on this line right over here. So as the debt to total capitalization increases, therefore the business takes on debt, the weighted average cost of capital actually decreases. So in instances where the business has no debt, it's better to actually take on some debt so, so the overall value of the business increases because the lower the disc discount rate, the lower WAC is, the higher the, the projected value of the business is. So it's better to take on a little bit of debt. But there there is a point where the cost of debt and really the benefits of that interest expense, the tax deductibility of that interest expense exceeds or is exceeded by the risk of leverage, right? Because the more debt that you take on, the more highly leveraged the business is and therefore the the more risk there is involved in the business, right? So there is, again, it's very hard to determine the exact optimal capital structure, but you want to target for that range because what that means is that when we're looking at the target capital structure, that is really the really the target value, the, the optimal value the business can be worth. 
if if the business is if there has no no debt then its value will be significantly lower than in a scenario where the business is at a target capital structure where it has a little bit of debt and some equity so that it has the its lowest whack possible and therefore its highest projected value so that's why you're aiming for the target capital structure so once this threshold is surpassed the uh, so once you know the once this level is surpassed the cost of potential financial distress the negative effects of an over leveraged capital structure including the increased probability of insolvency begins to override the tax advantages of debt it is assumed that the target capital structure is the optimal capital structure because management's goal is to maximize value so management's goal is to maximize value and it, when you're projecting the, the the performance of a business you have to keep that in mind they're trying to maximize value so they're assuming that they're they're the assumption is that they're aiming for that target op capital structure and therefore you need to input that targetable capital structure in your discount formula that was a long explanation if you have any questions do comment below on that <laughs> so now estimating the cost of debt for publicly traded bonds cost of debt is determined on the basis of the current yield on all outstanding issues for private debt such as revolving credit facilities and term loans the banker typically consults with an in-house debt capital markets specialist to ascertain the current yield Market-based approaches such as these are generally preferred as the current yield on a company's outstanding debt serves as the best indicator of its expected cost of debt and reflects the risk of default. I've made a separate video on just simply estimating the cost of debt. It's a 20-minute long video. I will link that in the video description as well if you're interested in that. But this is a good overview. Now, what about the cost of equity? This is where important assumptions are made, and we're going to spend some time on this. Cost of equity is the required annual rate of return that a company's equity investors expect to receive, including dividends. To calculate the expected return on a company's equity, the banker typically employs a formula known as the Capital Asset Pricing Model, the CAPM model. This is very important. Now, CAPM is based on the premise that equity investors need to be compensated for their assumptions of systematic risk in the form of a risk premium, beta, or the amount of market return in excess of a stated risk-free rate. Systematic risk is the risk related to the overall market, which is also known as non-diversifiable risk. So the cost of equity formula, the CAPM model, is RF, which is the risk-free rate, BL, which is the levered beta, and RM, which is the expected uh, return on the market. So you, you, you take your risk-free rate plus the result of multiplying the levered beta by the difference between the expected return on the market and the risk-free rate or the market risk premium. So you multiply the market risk premium by the levered beta and you add the risk-free rate to that to get your cost of equity. Now your cost of equity is always higher than your cost of debt. It, uh, yes, that I'll, I'll leave it at that because I'll confuse people if I go more than that. Now we're going to go into each of these individual numbers and understand them. So uh, first of all, talking about just this systematic risk the risk can be divided into two segments it can be divided into systematic market risk or company specific risk which is unsystematic risk now unsystematic or specific uh, company specific risk uh, can be avoided through diversification hence equity investors are not compensated for it and therefore the beta value only accounts for systematic risk as a general rule, the smaller the company, the more specified its product offering, the higher its unsystematic risk. And so we can account for the that size premium by adding additional size premium to the KPM formula. But we'll keep it at just a normal company, assuming that we can diversify the unsystematic risk. Some analysts might consider adding a size premium in order to account for this undiversifiable unsystematic risk. Now, the KPM variables. The risk-free rate is the expected rate of return obtained by investing in a riskless security. Uh, the U.S. government securities such as T-bills, T-notes, and T-bonds are accepted by the market as risk-free because they are backed by the full faith of the U.S. federal government, and therefore, they are the risk-free return, the lower threshold of what investors can expect to receive. Now, the market risk premium is the spread of the expected market return over the risk-free rate, so RM minus RF. So that is really accounts for you know the expected performance of the market or the expected uh, return that investors can receive over the risk-free rate so for the from 1926 to 2011 the Ibbotson calculated a market risk premium of 6.62 percent with Wall Street firms defining a range between eight five percent to eight percent so really in this formula 
you know, Ibbotson, which is a recognized, uh, you know, Wall Street institution providing a lot of research reports, uh, they recognize that 6.62% is the difference between uh, RM and RF, which can then be multiplied by the firm's levered beta. Now, it depends, again, on where you, you kind of source your information from. For Canadian firms, this will be different. But again, for just in general, that is a fair assumption to make that between 5 to 8% should be the market risk premium, the difference between RM and RF. Okay, I'm going to have to take some water because I'm thirsty. Alrighty. <clears throat> so beta. Beta is a measure of the covariance between the rate of return on a company's stock and the overall market return, systematic risk. As the S&P 500 has a beta of 1, a stock with a beta of 1 should have an expected return equal to that of the market, right? So the diff the expected market return, if the stock has a beta of 1, then it's uh, the performance of that stock is expected to match the performance of the S&P or the market. Now, if a stock has a smaller beta, then that return is less. Right? That's why we multiply beta by the expected market return. Essentially, that market risk premium the higher beta is, which means the, the more risky it is above the market, well, that means that the uh, thinking about risk and reward, the higher the risk, the higher the reward, right? So the higher the beta, the higher the market risk premium, and the higher the expected return for equity investors. The lower the beta, so if it's below one, the lower the return relative to the market, and therefore the lower the equity return for investors, right? So that's what really beta captures. The exercise of calculating WAC for a private company involves deriving beta from a group of publicly traded peer companies that may or may not have similar capital structures to one another or the target to neutralize the effects of different capital structures or to i.e to remove the influence of a leverage the banker must unlever the beta for each company in the peer group to achieve the asset beta so i'm going to spend some time here so why do we unlever and relever the beta i made a separate video on that as well check that out on my channel blah 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 um so for the beta that you find on Google Finance for a respective company is biased. It's not the true asset beta, right? When you're capturing beta, essentially what beta does is it captures the systematic risk of that company, right? So the market risk of that company. Now, market risk really capture, is captured by the entire industry uh, uh, for that respective company. So if it's a oil company, then really market risk or systematic risk is the systematic risk related to the oil industry. Right, so you want to get the asset beta or the unlevered beta. Now, the one that you find on Google Finance uh, is uh, that beta is impacted by the individual day-to-day -day performance of the individual company, whether you know it's suffering from internal issues, and at the same time, it's affected by the company's capital structure. If the company has a lot of debt, it might perform uh, poorly, and therefore, it might have a higher beta. It might be uh, much more risky. Right, even though in true terms, the true asset beta of the business is much lower. Right. So first, what you have to do is you have to unlever, remove the effect of that capital structure. And then what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to calculate the average unlever beta of the entire oil industry or universe of peers relative to that company. And then you're going to take the average of that peer group, reapply or lever up the beta, applying the company, the target company's capital structure again to then get determine the beta that you're going to use in the capital asset pricing model. Right. So to unlever the beta, you take the levered beta that you find on Google Finance, and then you divide that by one plus a debt to equity ratio tax affected. Right. So you tax affect the debt to equity ratio and then you add that or add one to that. And then you divide the, divide the levered beta by that result. So after calculating the unlevered beta for each company, the banker determines the average unlevered beta for the peer group possibly on a market cap weighted basis. So you take the peer group average and then you reliever it. So this average unlevered beta is then relevered using the company's target capital structure and marginal tax rate. It is important to use the target capital structure, which is oftentimes the current capital structure. This process ensures that a company's capital structure cannot influence the systematic risk that is captured in its beta. So we already talked about capital structure, target capital structure. We understand that we're assuming that management's goal is to maximize value. Therefore, we're assuming that management is heading towards that cap target capital structure or is already at that current 
capital structure, right? Now to relever beta, you take the unlevered uh, uh, beta, that the average for the peer group, and then you mul multiply that by the tax affected debt to equity ratio and add one to that, and you multiply the uh, the beta, the unlevered beta of that to get the relevered beta that you use in the capital asset pricing model. Okay, and so that's what you input in the KPEM. Now, the concept of a size premium is based on empirical evidence suggesting that smaller size companies are riskier and therefore should high, have a higher cost of equity. This phenomenon relies on the notion that smaller companies' risk is not entirely captured in their betas, given limited trading volumes of their stock, making covariance calculations ex inexact. So the assumption is, with KPM, usually the beta value captures the systematic risk of the business. But with smaller companies, sometimes the beta value doesn't truly reflect the systematic risk of the company. So adding an additional size premium accounts for that additional risk. And so that's what you can do for smaller companies. Now, what is that size premium? That is totally up to you. And this is, again, it's an assumption that that's, that's why it's such a science. When you're projecting the value of a company, it's, it's more science than act, it's more art than science. So it's, it's just, it's very, very difficult to, to project. And there are a lot of assumptions to make. And again, a lot of things can go wrong. So now we can calculate the WAC, right? So once you've calculated the cost of equity, cost of debt, and found the market value of equity and debt, you can calculate the weighted average cost of capital. This entire process with its numerous assumptions is the cornerstone of the DCF model because of its large impact on final projections. The higher the weighted average cost of capital, the lower the projected value, the lower the weighted average cost of capital, the higher the projected value. So that means that you need to make sure that you can stand by and defend your weighted average cost of capital because whether it's higher or lower relative to your competitors, it, the, the final uh, result will be significantly impacted by the individual assumptions you make, the, the cost of debt assumptions and the cost of equity assumptions, as well as the total capitalization assumptions. Now, step four, determine the terminal value. The DCF approach to valuation is based on determining the present value of all future free cash flow produced by a company. As it is infeasible to project a company's free cash flow indefinitely, the banker uses a terminal value to capture the value of the company beyond the projection period. As its name suggests, terminal value is typically calculated on the basis of the company's free cash flow in the final year of the projection period. The terminal value typically accounts for a substantial portion of the company's uh, value in a DCF, sometimes as much as three quarters or more. The aim is to have it two thirds, but three quarters is fair. Therefore, it is important that the company's terminal year financial data represents a steady state level of financial performance as opposed to a cyclical high or low. And we already talked about this when we were making the, the assumptions regarding the projection period, because at the end of the day, the, whether we're going to be using the two methods, the exit multiple method or the perpetuity growth method, or the also known as the Gordon growth method, if we use either of these two methods, the final uh, year data is needs to represent the steady state of the business because that will influence the overall terminal value calculation, which makes up at least three quarters of the projected value. So you need to make sure that this final year is very, very accurate. Uh, with regards to the steady state of the business. So the first method to calculate the terminal value is the exit multiple method, the EMM. The EMM calculates the remaining value of a company's free cash flow produced after the projection period on the basis of a multiple of its terminal year EBITDA or EBIT and sometimes even sales for technology companies. This multiple is typically based on the current last 12 months trading multiples for com uh, comparable companies. As current multiples may be affected by sector or economic cycles, it is important to use both a normalized trading multiple and EBITDA. So the terminal value with the EM, EMM, uh, you take the EBITDA of the final period and you multiply it by the exit multiple, which you found using the last 12 month uh, multiples that were found in the industry, right? So, and you wanna make sure that that multiple is a normalized or at least at a steady state level. Say, for example, you're conducting a terminal value calculation using the exit multiple method in 2007. It would not be fair to take a multiple from that year because it's in, it's a cyclical high and eventually the financial re recession will hit. Right. So what you need to assume is maybe take a, a multiple from 2004 or 2003 where the economy was much more normalized and it was in a much more steady state level. OK. Now, the PGM, the perpetuity growth method, calculates terminal value by treating a company's terminal free cash flow as a perpetuity growing at an assumed rate. 
The perpetuity growth rate is typically chosen on the basis of the company's expected long-term industry growth rate, which generally tends to be within a range of 2 to 4%, which matches the nom- expected nominal GDP growth rate. Right? So the, the PGM, what you do is you take the final year free cash flow calculation. This is why your free ca- your final year needs to be accurate. Now, that you take that final year free cash flow calculation, you multiply that by 1 plus the growth rate, which ranges between 2 to 4%, sometimes even higher for technology companies, and you divide that by the difference between the discount rate and the growth rate. Now, say, for example, the, the growth rate is higher than the discount rate, then you can't really use the PGM method and you have to use the exit multiple method. But that only is in some cases. Usually the discount rate, which is the WAC, is usually higher than the growth rate, right? And then you divide that by R minus G and you get your terminal value and then you add that and discount that back to the present. Now, the PGM is often used in conjunction with the EMM, with each serving as a sanity check on the other. For example, if the applied perpetuity growth rate, as derived from the EMM, is too high or low, it, it could be an indicator that the exit multiple assumptions are unrealistic. So these are uh, these are calculations that you can use to really check what uh, the projections that the exit multiple uh, projected, right? And so I won't spend a lot of time on this. You can kind of pause the video and try these calculations out for yourself. And it's the same thing with the perpetuity growth method. There are different ways you can check that uh, these projections. It's better to really just understand the PGM and the EMM method right now whereas making those checks are much more advanced than just for you know senior bankers. Okay, so now step five. You calculate the present value and determine valuation. So in a DCF, a company's projected free cash flow and terminal value are discounted to the present at the company's weighted average cost of capital in, co- in accordance with the time value of money. Now, it's very important. First of all, when you're going to be projecting the terminal value of the business, you got to discount it back to the present. And at the same time, you want to also discount the projected free cash flows in the explicit forecast period back to the present. Now, the discount factor is essentially one. This is the time value money, basic time value money calculation. One divided by one plus the weighted average cost of capital raised the power of N, which is the period. So in year one, it would be one and year two would be two. Right. And so as the time uh, uh as, as N increases, the discount factor increases, uh, uh, decreases. Because at the end of the day, what, what happens is with t- the time value of money, a dollar today is worth more than, than a dollar tomorrow, right? So with that present value calculation, essentially you can take the free cash flow uh, projected in period N and you use the discount factor of that same period, right? So if uh, in the first period, uh, the free cash flow uh, projection is 100 million, you multiply that by the discount rate, which assuming a weighted average cost of capital of 10, uh, raised to the power of one, that means that the discount rate is 0.91, right? Now to account for the fact that annual free cash flow is usually received throughout the year rather than at year end, it is typically discounted in accordance with a mid-year convention. Now, this is very important because a lot, I, I, in my models, I use the mid-year convention assumption rather than the full year uh, uh, convention assumption. Essentially, when you are projecting free cash flows and discounting them back to the future, if you are discounting using full numbers such as one, two, three, four, you're really assuming that all of that cash is received for that business at the end of the year. But that's unrealistic. Really, the business kind of receives it throughout the year. So a more realistic assumption is to raise it to the power of N minus 0.5. So assume it mid-year. That's why it's called the mid-year convention. So we're assuming that we're going to discount it at the middle of the year rather than that year end, right? So that same discount rate, which uh, we have a a weighted average cost of capital of 10%. uh, So instead of discounting it at the power of one, we're discounting at the power of 0.5. So we've realized that cash in mid-year, the discount rate is significantly higher. And so therefore, the use of the mid-year convention results in a slightly higher valuation than the year-end discounting due to the fact that free cash flow is received sooner. So it's a big assumption. In some cases, it's not the case. Maybe uh, it's it's a business where it only uh, really receives cash uh, in in the winter season and in the uh, spring and summer seasons, it doesn't really receive a lot of cash. Well, then in that case, the year-end discounting is better. But in most cases, the mid-year convention makes much more sense theoretically. Now, when employing a mid-year convention for the projection period, mid-year discounting is also applied for the terminal value under the PGM. 
The EMM, however, which is typically based on the last 12 months trading multiples of comparable companies for a calendar year and EBITDA or EBIT, uses year-end discounting. So essentially, if you're going to use the Gordon growth or the PG, the perpetuity growth method, you can use the discounting factor uh, raised to the power of N minus 0.5. However, if you're going to use the exit multiple method, when you're discounting that uh, terminal value back to the present, you're discounting it using the year-end uh, discounting assumption because that's based on the last 12 months trading multiples, which are based on the uh, year-end discounting. Okay, so let's look at a simple illustration. And we're very close to the end of the video. Don't worry. So a company's projected free cash flow and terminal value are are each discounted to the present and some to provide an enterprise value. Right. So here we have years one, two, three, four, and we're assuming year five is the terminal year. So you can uh, project the free cash flow. So after all of our assumptions, which we talked about in the previous slides, we get our free cash flow in year one, two, three, four, five. Well, now we assume this is mid-year discounting because it's raised to the power of n minus one, a uh, minus zero point five. So it would be zero point five, one point five, two point five, three point five, and four point five. If this was uh, year-end discounting, this would be one, two, three, four, five right? Because it's N minus 0 0.5. And so we have our weighted average cost of capital. So in the first four years, all we're doing is we're discounting the explicit forecast for the free cash flow back to the present. In year five, we're also discounting that, for, that free cash flow earned in year five back to the present. But we're also taking the EBITDA in that year five, taking an exit multiple and discounting that using the year end discounting factor back to the present. So we're taking the explicit forecast period. So we're taking the sum of the projected free cash flows and we're taking the present value of the terminal value calculation and discounting the back. And so we're adding all of that to get the enterprise value. Okay. Now, once you have calculated the enterprise value, you can get implied equity value because really when we project enter enterprise value for a business, that's not relevant relative to the current share price of the business. So what to get the current projected current share price or the underlying current share price or the underlying value of the share price, you can take the enterprise value that was calculated in the previous slide. Sorry. So this enterprise value, you then remove the effects, right? So if you remember the enterprise value calculation, to get from equity value to enterprise value, you add debt, you add preferred equity and minority interests, and then you subtract away cash and cash equivalents. Now you can reverse that. So to move from enterprise value back to e equity value, you can then uh, subtract net debt plus preferred stock plus non-controlling interest. So the sum of net debt plus preferred stock plus non-controlling interest. I don't like the way this illustration kind of explains it. The, really the way you should think about it is just reverse end, right? So you take enterprise value, you subtract debt because before you added it, you subtract preferred stock because before you added it, you subtract uh, non-controlling interest and you add back cash and cash equivalents. Whereas before you were taking it away. Right. And so that will give you your implied equity value for the aggregate business. And then to get the implied share price, you define you divide that implied equity value by fully diluted shares outstanding. OK. And then finally, you can employ sensitivity uh, analysis. And really, this kind of uh, displays different assumptions. So say, for example, in this case, we have the weighted average cost of capital and the exit multiple method. And in Excel, you can do this, but just uh, I will only spend one slide on this. The DCF incorporates numerous assumptions, each of which can have a sizable impact on valuation. As a result, the DCF output is viewed in terms of a valuation range based on a series of key input assumptions rather than as a single value. The exercise of deriving a valuation range by vary varying key inputs is called a sensitivity analysis. So essentially, you can uh, in Excel, you can input your initial assumptions of 10% and 7.5x as the exit multiple, and you can play around. So if I were to reduce my exit multiple to 7 instead of 7.5 or 6.5 instead of 7.5x for EBITDA, how would that impact my my overall enterprise value? And so this is a great way to display to clients or to people who you're pitching your business to how our assumptions if we were to change those assumptions, how the projection would change overall, right? And this is very helpful for you as well. Now I'll make a quick comment. In my uh, DCF mistakes video, I talked about this. It's very important to pay attention to the how the projections change when the assumptions change. So say for example, uh, if you're moving from a weighted average cost of capital of 10 to 9.5, the value would increase because you're discounting those free cash flows less, right? 
Now, that change in valuation, the change in enterprise value, if this increases from 6,000 to 12,000, something's wrong in the model. It's a great little check to remember. When you're checking your models, look at your sensitivity analysis. See how sensitive the value is relative to assumptions. If the assumptions change by just an incremental amount, but the entire value of the business changes significantly, there are something wrong. We're depending way too much on the weighted average cost of capital, and therefore your model is incorrect. A health model, if you change the assumptions incrementally, the valuation will also change incrementally. Now, incrementally could mean 292 million, but it's not 4 billion. And that's really important because in my early models, I remember I went back to my early, early models when I was like in, in high school and I was just building out these little fun DCF models. They were absolute garbage. I mean, like, honestly, I would change my my weighted average cost of capital by 5% and the business would double in value. And I looked at that and I'm like, damn, you were an idiot back then. But yes, so finance kid, finance kid has smartened up since then but that's a very good way to check your uh, check your model okay so now in summary what are the advantages of a discounted cash flow model first it's a cash flow base it reflects a value of projected free cash flow re which represents a more fundamental approach to valuation this is what v warren buffett loves he loves the cash that's generated and so really it assumes it projects the intrinsic value of the business rather than the market value of the business it's also market independent so it's more insulated from you know uh, irrational uh, you know whether it's exuberance or you know uh you know pessimism it's also self-sufficient it does not rely entirely on truly uh, comparable companies more it's more it, it's more important on it does not depend on pure play comps as well whereas the uh, comparable companies analysis and the percent precedent transactions analysis uh they depend more heavily on uh, the peer group that you're comparing to your company to right and it's also it provides a lot more flexibility it allows the banker to run multiple financial performance scenarios including uh, improving or declining growth rates margins etc so that's why the sensitivity analysis is very important because when you're talking to management, say for example, this is this is the model that we pre we've presented to management. But say for example, management's like, hey, you know what? We're beginning to feel much more confident, and we can show you that yes, the business is going to perform more better in the future. Okay, well then maybe the weighted average cost of capital will decline and the multiple will increase, and that means that instead of the six six billion dollars, your business is actually worth six point four one eight billion dollars. Okay. Now, what are the disadvantages? It depends on financial projections. Again, this is where a lot of errors result. If you were assuming percentage of sales for your networking capital and your CAPEX and your depreciation, is that truly fair? Is At the end of the day, we don't have a crystal ball to really project the, the real performance of the business in the future. So our, we're depending on projections, which can really go wrong. Also, it's very sensitive to different assumptions, right? Whether it's WAC margins or exit multiples, there are different assumptions that are made with regards to our terminal value. And as well, that's another disadvantage. When we really talk about terminal value, it makes up at least three uh, three quarters of the projection, right? And so that means that we really want to make sure that uh, the final year projection for the explicit uh, forecast period, that final year is a steady state. And majority of the time, it, it isn't. When you hear about these really, really bad M&A deals, a lot of the time, it's management's exuberance. And excuse me, in, in assuming that, oh, look, we're going to perform at this level for, you know, five years, and really, they only perform for three years, right? And so there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of um, overconfidence, which results in overvaluation, and therefore a lot of uh, shareholder destruction, right? And then finally, there's a, uh, when you assume a constant capital structure, so you're assuming that the, the, uh, the, the debt to total capitalization, the equity total co capitalization is the same throughout the model, and that therefore the WAC is the same throughout the model, that is a big assumption, which is very unrealistic, because majority of the time, the business is going to change, it's either going to increase its debt, or, or, or it's going to decrease its debt load, right? And therefore, the weighted average cost of capital will decline. And we can never we can't project that we don't know what the future needs of the business will be when it comes to, you know, the amount of debt that they need, maybe just a little bit based on management in our conversation with management. But at the same time, we're not for sure. And that's a big disadvantage, especially because it impacts the future performance of the business and the future value of the business. Other than that, oh, my God, I think I, I talked like a million words. That's essentially it for the video. If you did like the video, please like and subscribe to the channel. It takes a long time to make these videos, but hopefully they are helpful. This is by, I'm sure pretty much the most comprehensive video on the discounted cash flow model. If you have any questions, be, please do comment below and I'll be sure to get back to you. This is my favorite 
really valuation technique. I've spent a lot of time. I I was I was in high school. I was in grade ten building DCF model. So I love I love the DCF model. I've spent a lot a, a years really learning about the assumptions and and really it's more art than science when you do spend a lot of time and making these assumptions. So if you do have any questions, please do comment below. And other than that, have a great day, guys. Good luck on your interviews and really good luck at school. Thank you.